The issue of logistics became far worse once the Crusaders passed into enemy territory, and particularly given the season and the choice of route. The Crusaders entered Asia Minor in October, as winter was approaching, when food and fodder for their animals was inevitably scarce, and when bad weather was going to be a problem. And the Asia Minor Plateau can be extremely cold and hospitable, inhospitable in winter. Furthermore, the Germans decided to follow the route of the First Crusade straight across Asia Minor, rather than proceeding by the longer but safer route around the coast, where for much of the time they would be in or near Byzantine territory. They began to run short of food after only some ten days on the march. Conrad and his army eventually retreated, not so much because of Turkish attacks, although they were heavily engaged with the enemy, but because of shortage of food. One German chronicler, the contemporary Magdeburg analyst, reported that they were defeated by hard labour, hunger and thirst, even though he claimed they had not fought a full-scale battle. Other sources do, however, talk of a German defeat in the Battle of Dorylea, where the First Crusade had won the first of its major victories. But it is clear that supply problems, as much as the Turks, caused Conrad and his army to withdraw. He retreated to the west coast and eventually fell ill and returned to Constantinople to recuperate. A separate section of his army, containing most of the camp followers and hangers-on, had been sent by the coastal route under the command of Bishop Otto of Freising, but was heavily attacked by the Turks and largely destroyed. The French, meanwhile, after an abortive attempt to join up with the Germans near Ephesus, which had been abandoned when the Germans couldn't keep up with them, marched round the coast, and after a brutal battle with the Turks on Mount Cadmus in January 1148, struggled into Anatolia in Cilicia in southeast Asia Minor. From there, Louis and his chief nobles went by sea to Antioch, leaving the rest of the army to follow by land as best it could under the command of the Count of Flanders. This section was roughly handled by the Turks, although the Count himself, and some at least of his force, did get through to Antioch. Conrad, meanwhile, travelled by sea in Byzantine ships from Constantinople to Acre in Palestine, where he arrived in April 1148. Discussion of the Crusade often centres on what happened in Asia Minor, with the assumption that although Louis and eventually Conrad did arrive in the Crusader states, the expedition had never recovered from its rough handling in Asia Minor and was already doomed to fail. That view is almost certainly erroneous. We tend to concentrate on Asia Minor because our one lengthy and detailed eyewitness account, that of the French chronicler Odo of Die, which I've already mentioned, discusses this part of the expedition. But Odo concluded his account with the arrival of King Louis at Antioch. Thereafter, contemporary accounts of the Crusade tend to be brief, and a number of them were written in fact, some years after the event. Sadly, Otto of Freising, one of the leaders of the Crusade, and as half-brother of the German king, a man certainly in a position to know what was what, left only a very brief account of what transpired in the Holy Land in the summer of 1148. One gets the impression that the Crusade was simply too painful or too embarrassing for him to wish to go into any great detail in his history. There is no doubt that casualties in Asia Minor were heavy. Archbishop William of Tyre, the principal 12th century historian of the Crusader States, indeed claimed that King Conrad lost nine tenths of his army in Asia Minor. In addition, we know that when Conrad returned to Constantinople, some of the German contingent lost heart and took the opportunity to return home. But should we take William of Tyre's account at face value? 
He was, after all, writing about 25 years later, and he was not an eyewitness. Indeed, in 1147-8, we know that he was in Europe, undertaking his higher education at the schools of Paris, not in the Holy Land, and thus he never met or saw what was left of the Crusade. There is also the question of the makeup of the Crusade armies. Other sources, including the letter that Conrad wrote home to his regent in Germany, Abbot Guibald of Stavelot, in January 1148, suggest that most of the casualties were suffered by the foot soldiers and the non-combatants, and that these poorer members of the expedition were also the ones who suffered disproportionately from the effect of food shortages. When Conrad eventually arrived in Palestine in April 1148, he was still accompanied by a substantial number of German bishops and nobles. And subsidies from his ally, Manuel Comnenus, enabled him to hire some fresh troops there, recruited especially from pilgrims who happened to be visiting the Holy Land at that time. But Conrad had more than that with him. The great men of the army did not travel alone. They were surrounded by their familiae, their military households and vassals. And in circumstances such as the retreat from Dorylaeum, the greater discipline and cohesion of these military familiae, as well as the better armour and weapons, and of course horses, of the mounted knights who comprised them, enabled them to survive where the ill-disciplined and ill-supplied infantry were far more at risk. The contemporary Würzburg analyst, for example, suggests that when Conrad retreated to Ephesus, he was accompanied by all his princes and his whole knighthood. So, did William of Tyre exaggerate the scale of the German losses in Asia Minor? Instead of literally nine-tenths of the army being lost, did he simply mean that German casualties were heavy without being any more specific. Similarly, when Louis arrived in Antioch, he wrote home complaining, not about being short of men, but about being short of money. Indeed, he reported that the majority of his princes had arrived at Antioch safely. The French had admittedly lost a number of important men in the bitter battle on Mount Cadmus, but we are still told that when the army reached Anatalia, food was short because there were so many people there. Hence, when the two kings arrived in the east, they still had significant military forces with them, despite the losses in Asia Minor. Furthermore, even if their armies were considerably reduced, they represented still a substantial reinforcement for the relatively modest forces that were available to the rulers of the Crusader states. What evidence we have suggests that the 12th century kingdom of Jerusalem could muster perhaps 700 knights in its defence, plus whatever forces the relatively new military monastic orders could now provide. In 1148, this was clearly nowhere near as many as they could dispose of later in the century, for as yet their possessions in the East were relatively modest. The Principality of Antioch and the County of Tripoli, the other two Crusader states, could between them muster perhaps 500 knights. Obviously, these figures refer to the mounted cavalry, who were the hard core of the Crusader forces, and along with them, several thousand infantry and light troops would also have been available. But these forces were still, even by contemporary standards, quite modest. And the survivors of the Second Crusade, and as I've suggested, there is good reason to think that more survived Asia Minor than we might think, represented a significant addition to the Christian forces in the East. The question was, what to do with them? The decision that was eventually taken in June 1148 was that the combined forces of the Western Crusaders 
and of the kingdom of Jerusalem would attack Damascus. That decision has often been condemned by modern historians. One distinguished living historian of the Crusades has called it simply folly. And as it turned out, the siege of Damascus was abandoned after five days, the Crusader army withdrew, an attempt to launch another attack elsewhere failed when the local barons decided not to turn up, and eventually both Conrad and Louis went home thoroughly disillusioned. But was the decision to attack Damascus quite so stupid as some people have suggested? I would argue that it was not. First of all, Edessa was not a feasible target for the Crusade. The fall of Edessa had been the occasion for calling the Crusade, but Edessa was too far away, too difficult to hold, even had the Crusaders been able to recapture it, and much of the formerly Christian population of the region had been driven out or massacred by the Muslims. There was no effective prospect of attacking Edessa. Strategically, Aleppo in northern Syria might well have been the obvious target for the crusade. It was the ruler of Aleppo, Zengi, who had captured Edessa, and although Zengi was dead by 1148, his son, Nur ad-Din, was the major threat to the Christian states in the east. 